Two minutes. Okay. Great. Do you want one of these? Yeah, I'll take one. Okay. One minute. One minute of counting. So we we'll just introduce. I just say hi and then. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Peter Stansfield from WaveQuest Systems, and I'm Daniel Harris from Kendra Initiative, and we're going to talk about getting your Drupal projects funded by EU and UK grants. And uh, Peter's going to speak for around about 20 minutes, and I'm going to speak for about 10, and then we'll field some questions and take it away, Peter. Sure, okay. So the split is going to be that I'm going to be talking about how to get grants, and Daniel's going to be talking about the other side of the fence, the practical experience of having been in projects which have been grant funded, both the advantaged years and the disadvantaged years. So, to introduce myself, I'm coming from a physics background, and the first project I ever applied for was out of frustration, because the company I was working for at the time, um, I had this really, really great idea. I went to see the managing director and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we built one of these? And he said, well, it's a fantastic idea, but we just can't afford to. So unbeknown to him, I went off, learned about how funding worked, filled in the forms, applied for the grant, and went back to him three months later saying, remember that project you wanted to do that we couldn't afford? Well, hey, I've got the money now, can I do it? So that's my sort of introduction to, to funding and how it all works. Right, so what we're going to be looking at in this session is why do governments fund technology development? And this is all a bit like being a, a policeman trying to work out the modus operandi of the criminal. If you understand what's going on in his mind, it's actually quite easy to understand. We're going to be talking about how they choose what to fund, which is obviously very important if you want to be successful. We're going to be looking at both the advantages and the disadvantages of getting public funding, because there's a lot of both. And then we're going to be talking about how to get started in this, this vast jungle. We're going to be looking very briefly at the different schemes that are available. I mean, just on the schemes available, I could talk for three to four hours, so this is really going to be overview stuff, but hopefully it's enough for you, you guys to start asking the questions then about, you know, what really matters. We're going to give a hint about reading what's wanted, because it's a lot of work to put in a good quality application, and if you don't put in a good quality proposal, you're not going to win, but so you really need to be sure that what you want to do fits with what the people who've got the money um, are looking for. We're going to talk very briefly about how to run a project that's got public funding and then summarise the things that we've, we've said. So, why do governments fund technology development? <coughs> I mean, the European Commission alone in Framework 7 gave away 75 billion euros. 75,000 million euros. 62,000 million pounds. Vast sums! Why do they do it? And that's because things like this are policy driven. The European Commission wisely employed Aho, who was the ex Prime Minister of Finland, and he did a complete survey of Europe's strengths and weaknesses, saying, hey guys, what are we good at? What are we not good at? And he decided that basically, in mi minerals, we'd had it. We'd run out of coal, we hadn't got any steel resources, we'd chopped down all the forests, there's virtually nothing left. He looked at manufacturing and noted that us Westerners tend to pay ourselves more than our Chinese colleagues and that manufacturing is incredibly expensive in Europe. So he started to say, well, look what's left. What's Europe good at and what needs encouraging? And out of that came the ICT side of things. Mobile phones, telecoms, applications new ways of doing things, new business methods. And that's what basically the European Commission is, is staking the whole farm on. The fact that we guys are good at this. We're not just good, we're the best in the world. And that by encouraging the stimulation of this, we can generate enough wealth to pay for the bills, social, health care, and everything else. It's a complete ecosystem when you think about it. But it's, you know, it's a, not many people get this far down into it. The whole idea, obviously, is that the commission invests and gets returns because what happens? Your company grows, you employ more people. 
What does that mean? You pay more tax as a company. What does that mean? The people that you employ pay taxes. And what do the people do with the net salary that they've got left over after they've been paying their taxes? They go out and buy toys which have got tax on. More computers, more laptops, more, more iPads, i anything. So you can see that the, the stimulation process is, is what really funds these things. How do they choose what to fund? Well, they can just have a lucky dip and put their hand in a bag and pull it out and go, oh, this one, oh. But no, it's not like that. There are two sorts of schemes to apply for. One is an open call, where it says, look, we're looking for ideas. And the other one is a work programme that says, look, we, the European Commission, for example, believe that what really needs doing is the development of computer networks in the 8 to 12 gigahertz bandwidth involving this and, and, and. And that's defined in, in the work programme. There's really two criteria in these things. One is novelty. No one is going to fund something which has already been done before. No one's going to fund any of you in this room to copy something that already exists because, hey, what's the point? It already exists. One of the examples I use to give over the novelty criteria is that, for example, if the Ford Motor Company went to the European Commission and said, hey, we've got this great idea, it's called the Mondeo 2014. It's a bit like the 2013, but it's a bit curvier at the background, and it's got an extra mile per gallon. Isn't this a great idea? Isn't this innovative? And the answer is no. You're Ford. You produce a new Mondeo every year. That's your business. But if Ford went to the, um, the Technology Strategy Board or any of the funding bodies and said, hey, great idea. We make cars. Roads are getting very crowded. We've got this idea that we could use the seats and the steering wheel out of a Ford Mondeo. And we could build helicopters. The helicopters, hey, really risky stuff. You know, we never built one before. It might not work. And we need to find out more about engines. That is innovative. It's doing something that you don't do that isn't done. The other one is exploitation, because as we talked about, all of these things only work if there's a way of turning research into business, business, trade, money. So if you're a sole individual and you are working in your garage and you think you've got a project that will eventually cure cancer, hey, that's a wonderful thing to do. But how is one man in his garage going to distribute a worldwide cure to cancer. Well, I mean, hey, you could license it through pharmaceutical companies, but there has to be some connection in any funding proposal about the way that money will be made. I know money can be a dirty subject in ways, but hey, as they say, it makes the world go round. Reputation helps. It isn't everything, because ideally the best projects will get funded, but by working with well-known brands, leaders, not just academics, but the best academics in Europe, you stand a lot more chance of, of succeeding. So what's the advantage of being a funded scheme? Hey, you get money. That's not all. Money is one reason to do this, but it's access to partners within a fair framework. All of these collaborative schemes have a reasonable framework set up so that one partner can't completely screw another partner. It's a fair trading mechanism within these projects. So it's a way of being able to work with partners that you really want to work with, big names, companies in other countries, academics in other fields, to bring things together. It's also a way of getting recognition and publicity. One of the projects that we're managing at the moment, which is funded by the Technology Strategy Board, has now had 200,000 hits on their YouTube site and have had uh, 347 um, <coughs> mentions on the web. So, hey, you know, this really sort of brings, brings people's attention to things. And it's also amazing what happens in collaborative projects, you know, around the mythical water cooler. It's sometimes the best part of these project meetings are the, the coffee breaks and the lunch times where you say, hey, what if I got my whatever, and hooked it up to your whatever like this, and hmm, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? These sort of things. As another side consequence, in one project I'm involved in recently, the project manager from one company has ended up managing the junior project manager in another company, so hey, that's another side of these projects. What are the disadvantages? Well, to start with, you're tied in to a certain extent to a project plan, because if you get the funding, 
you're committed to do this amount of work in this direction for this amount of money. Now, it's not carved in stone because no funding body wants you to carry on making white elephants after the white <coughs> elephant shop has closed. It has to be relevant, they realise that. But you can't just suddenly change your mind mid-project and try and do something else. Not without consulting the funding body who, hey, have got a big financial stake in this. Obviously there is a reporting and auditing. If you do get public money, you do have to remember it's your next door neighbour's tax money that you're spending. And surely your next door neighbour wants that to be accountable. He wants you to be reporting to the funding body what you're doing. And he wants independent <coughs> financial checks that you really did need to go to the United States 11 times that month or whatever. The other disadvantage is that to a certain extent you have to give away the outline of what you're doing. Being taxpayers' money, it can't be spent secretly. So there always has to be an abstract, at least, of what you're doing published. It needn't have the technical details, the secrets, the real guts of it, but the overview has to be public. To say it doesn't have to be open source if we close them. Sure, yeah, 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 either way, either way, yeah. And also, you're tied into a partnership. If you start a three year project working with companies X, Y, and Z, 18 months into it, you can't say to company X, oh, we don't like working with anyone, off you go. Because that smashes the project, it doesn't work. You know, it, it's like being in a temporary marriage. How to get started? It's a vast subject, but pretty well everything you need to know is in the public domain. The Technology Strategy Board in the UK has funded £1 billion worth of research over the past five years. They're our local funding and sourcing agency. They've got a website. All of the rule books documentation is published there. They issue calls. It's worth reading the calls. For pseudo-European areas, there's Eureka, which has its own website, uh, eureka.eu. Um, it's got schemes, rule books, and calls published there. The European Commission publishes a vast amount of calls and procedures and manuals and everything else online. And as a warning, it's written in a peculiar Spanglish, Frenchish, all sorts of mix of European languages. Quite a lot of it is actually quite incomprehensible, but there are always guys there who can answer about what do you really mean by this. Another way which isn't compulsory is to use consultants. And consultants such as myself um, will offer free initial visits. If you think you've got an idea, let's talk about it. Hey, we, we're not going to charge you anything to talk about it. And only if we think there's a prospect of it would we put together a plan for you to work with you, which you can take or you can leave, hey. The schemes and sorts of funding. Now, I'm really could, you know, this is something that you could talk for hours on. The UK has a scheme where small to medium sized enterprises, which is companies of less than 250 people and less pounds, to develop something. It's not to a work program, so anything that meets the criteria, is it innovative and is it exploitable, and can you exploit it, is, is, is possible. There are collaborative funding calls in the UK, and a recent one was on big data. Um, it was monetarising big data, so you could put in a project with a university and another company saying, hey, we've got this great idea to make money out of big data. Eurostars is a scheme for European SMEs to collaborate across European boundaries. This is another scheme that's highly undersubscribed, which is quite unusual in these things, because it's one of these that is a little bit tricky, but hey, we know the rules. Framework, the European Commission's framework is where the big money is. There's going to be best part of a trillion euros put into the next framework, which logically would be framework eight, but the Commission have obviously can't count beyond seven. So this one's going to be called Horizon 2020. All schemes have very different rules and goals. The basic principles are the same. Look, you give us money, we'll spend it, we'll try and make wealth with it. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing. But the actual implementation is very different in all schemes. If you do apply for something, read what's wanted. Don't force an idea into an suitable scheme. You're just wasting your time, you're wasting your evaluator's time. Do read the rules. Read every single rule, because the last thing you want to do is to put in months and months of work, and because of rule 7.4.9, which you haven't read, it doesn't apply to companies that employ people called Smith or something. 
do read the rules and use the information as wisely as you can. Now, for a consultant who makes a living out of helping people do this, it probably seems odd for me to say, don't apply unless you really, really think you're going to get it. It's a very competitive business in most schemes, and if you half-heartedly put in an application, it's almost certainly going to fail. Don't half-heartedly put in three applications. Focus, work out what's really the best one, and put everything you've got into that, and then there's a chance that you can win. The other thing for those that we have got established businesses anyway, is don't let this take over your life. We've seen companies nearly destroyed because they get so fixated on this. They take their eye off the ball for their present business, their present customers, their present sort of development. You know, you really do need to, to keep both going. Some schemes, particularly in framework, are 20 to 1 oversubscribed. So basically, you've got to be in the top 5% to succeed. Which is why, as consultants, we spend an awful lot of our time saying no to people. Saying, no, the idea doesn't fit. No, the idea is not good enough. No, the partnership's not good enough. No, it's not going to work. But that's, you know, <laughs> how we succeed. Okay, so assuming you do get a project, and Daniel will be talking about this more in detail, we really strongly advise get a project manager to look after it. You're going to be getting extra money in, so rather than try and put all of that in your pocket, spend some of it wisely on someone who can really get the best out of the project. It might be your only chance, so really try and do well in the project, and by that, you know, get someone to look after it who's done it before. Be accountable. You need to be a little bit more open than you would be if it was an in-house development. You need to let your partners know what you're doing. And you really need to treat your partners well, otherwise they're not going to work with you again. You know, be considerate to your partners, particularly if they're from different languages, different cultures, different ways of doing things. Um, partnerships can be a wonderful experience, they can be a disaster. But, you know, go into it, trying to be as open and as helpful as you can to your partners. Okay, so I think what I'm really saying is that public funding isn't always the right answer to every problem. Sometimes people come to us and we say, look, this is such a good idea. Why do you need public funding? Couldn't you just borrow the money somewhere, plow it in, turn the handle, and the gold bricks come out? We're saying think carefully and or take advice on whether to apply. Because, you know, it's a hard work track and very few succeed in some schemes. If you're going to try, put in effort, only the best proposals are funded. If you are funded, get a project manager, and don't take your eye off the core business. I mean, that's, I think, all I can say at the time. Over to Daniel. Thank you very much. Do you want to stand yeah. here? Really? Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay. So, as Peter did, did allude to, the, the European Commission does want SMEs. It, it, it does want to not just fund the Fords and the IBMs, which do get funding quite a lot, but they, they, they actually want to see a lot of the smaller players involved. So that's in some ways to your advantage. Also to your advantage are the fact that the people involved in creating these projects and managing these projects are looking out for SMEs because they need to fill kind of an SME quota. And, and so th there's, th there's, um, there's that. A, a, lot, a lot of application schemes will, will be compulsory to have at least one SME in, for example. Right. They, and they, there's also issues about which countries, you know, having, having kind of a, a good spread of countries. You can't all just have UK, for UK projects, UK companies involved in a European project. You need to have them spread out. And there's also um, having s companies from certain countries is sometimes an, advance, an advantage, but that's kind of a rumour that... Um, that, that is put about and unofficial, but it's been talked about. Um, find people who know the ropes. Peter has helped me out with invaluable advice ever since I started this, this quest. Um, and uh, I started this quest about, um, well, about the year 2000. After I sold my internet company, I kind of realized I had a bit of time to give, give back, and I thought, let's set up a uh, Kendra Initiative, a non-profit to make the, the whole media distribution system a better, play, a better place for artists and consumers. Um, I spent about eight years traveling around 
uh, and talking at conferences about how great this world would be and getting free booths because we're non-profit. And um, uh, at about, in about 2007, a guy came up to me from Pioneer and he started arguing with me saying, what are you talking about? This is, you're crazy. You have, you have no idea what you're doing. This is a pipe dream. Yes, I know, but we've got to start somewhere. Now, and then about six weeks later, we got invited into a 14 million euro uh, consortium two weeks before they submitted it to the EU. That did create problems, which, which I'll talk about. Um, but So these things happen in serendi you know, massive serendipity, right place, right time, right people. The thing is, put it out there that you want funding. It's not going to happen if you don't say to people, we're looking for funding, we want to go down this road. And, and that's what I was saying for eight years. <laughs> so finally it came true, vindicated. Um, Check out the chemistry of the people you're working with. Um, sometimes just like, oh wow, funding, great. I mean, in the first project we got 180,000 euro for over four years. Sounds a lot of money, but it isn't. It really isn't, considering what you actually have to do. In the second project we got uh, 280,000 euro in the, in for three years, which was a lot better ratio. But still, th these, these are kind of like, you know, you know it's, um, it's, it's, there are issues, so, so watch it. <laughs> um, it. In order to uh, get, get into this um, um, area, I mean, we didn't mingle. You know, I was always scared of, of, of funding. I was always scared of um, this whole bureaucracy. People mentioned it probably about four years into my quest. And... No, I'm not touching it. I never investigated it. I'm kicking myself now because it was probably easier to get funding in the early 2000s oh, yeah, than it was, you know, uh, uh, why did I not? But anyway, I was scared. It wasn't until someone was there just provide, you know, sign here. You know, give me a paragraph about what you're going to do and sign there. That paragraph is actually really important because you have to stick to it. And we had to stick to it. And so, so when you write what you're going to do, in, in the in the um, in the submission, it's very important that you really you're really happy with that. Um, <coughs> in the third project that we that we so we got two EU funded projects. Then we got a project under the Celtic stamp. Now that's an interesting system because it's it's not actually funded by Europe. It's funded by we're then transferred over to the UK, who um, actually pay for. The, Euro the European project, in a sense. So every participant within a Celtic project has to go to their own country to find, find the funding, which can create a lot of problems. But we, so uh, Kendra now has the promise of £100,000 as long as we can raise £80,000, um, which is different from the European funded projects where you actually get um, an, advanced so, payment. Yeah. Hmm? An, an advanced payment. An advanced payment and actually it covers a lot of lot more of your costs. So there's different ways, different different um, different ways of um, uh, uh, dif different advantages to different schemes. With with the Celtic project, um, that they were they were just about to submit. That you know they were a few weeks, of, you know maybe a month away from from submitting their project. And I rang them up and saying, Hey, what's happening? W w you know, uh, aren't we aren't we participating in this? He said, yeah, we're going to have you in the stakeholders group, which means you're not a partner, you're not going to get funding, you did get a few grand for coming over and talking to a few you know, breakout sessions. I said, hold on a second, no, we want to be involved. He said, oh, you do? Oh, okay, then, fine. So be bold, you know, say what you want. These guys sometimes just really open to like, um, yeah, okay, great. So, so that was the difference between a few grand and the potential of 180 grand. So, so be bold about what you want. Don't be scared about being, you know, going for what you want. Uh, <clears throat> there's, there's an issue about when you get the funding, in some cases you have, they have to be employees rather than contractors. It's a, it's a minor detail, you just have to pay PAYE rather than getting them in under um, a contractual basis. It, it, there's finer detail to that, but this is something to think about, and it's not always the case. You can actually have contractors, but um, pitfalls. Yes. Um, 
These projects are documentation heavy because you have to report what you're going to do. You have to report what you're going to do beforehand and you have to report what you've done afterwards. Um, that caused uh, Kendra some issues in that um, our culture was to create stuff. We wanted to build stuff um, using, incidentally, I haven't told you anything about what we've been doing. We've been using Drupal as the kind of central framework and bolting on solar and and um, Mahout uh, recommendation engine. In both cases of these projects that we were working on, um, they are peer-to-peer -peer, uh, media distribution systems. And um, in the first one we did, um, in peer-to-peer -peer next, we did, uh, the, a, a, um, we did a, a, a social overlay. So we were doing recommendations based on, you know, these people might be of interest to you, or this media might be of interest to you. All fun stuff. But in s some situations, we had to document it before we built it. <laughs> the, we don't know what we're getting into sometimes. We don't know what the technology is, what the, what the things that we'll have to do. So when you build the specification, when you build the submission, you build the project plan that you submit to the EU, it's at that point you've got to say, actually, we're not going to do a big doc before and then a big doc after. We're going to have to do an iterative process. And it's because the culture of the people you're working with might be totally different. No, we're going to, it's the whole agile versus whatever the opposite of agile is. You know, it, it's... Unagile. Un un Unagile, yeah. So watch out for that. So yes, yeah, insist on a modular and iterative approach. If you insist, you can get what you want. You've just got to be bold. Don't, don't let them have the better of you if you're in a collaborative team. Come in, you're coming in with your skill set, your, your new innovation, your new innov innovative skill set. So bring that to them. That, you know, a lot of these are academics or, or big companies who are stuck in some ways sometimes. So this is useful for them too. And you know, useful for the whole you know, framework in a wider sense about collaborating, collaborating, collaborating <laughs> in, in the EU. A big issue, watch out for cash flow. Um, this is just one line, but it, there's so much involved in this. You get an upfront payment in some schemes. You then get paid retrospectively. If you don't have a cash store, you will have problems. And they always keep 15% until the project is finished. So in the case of, if you're getting, if the total project uh, contribution from the EU is, is, is 300, thousand K, that's a lot of money that you've got, you already spent before you get it at the end. So watch out for that. And, and these are just all lessons that I've learned. When, when, we did, when we put in our first project, it was the 14 million euro. We had 1% of, of, of the total budget. It made us a really small guy. In a, and the thing is, they still, they, they still had their four meetings a year, but we didn't necessarily have the budget to be at every one of those meetings. When that happens, that, put, that makes you out of the loop. And when you're out of the loop, you're not kind of, you're not able to participate in the same, same way. So, so really take that into account. Um, hence, be careful about joining large multi-million euro projects where you're a small player. player. If, you're, if you're kind of equal, or in, in, that, in that similar vein, similar magnitude, then great. Because you're all going to have the same constraints. But if you are a really small player, they'll, you'll still be expected to come to every meeting. You'll still, still be expected to um, do all, all of the documentation. And be, un, <laughs> in hindsight, under, under, under promise. No, don't overextend yourself. Um, I think we probably did both times. And um, we, we, um, we, you know, just about came through. It, it's been, a, it's been, a, it's been a, a, a very good learning process and um, there you go. Yeah, yeah, the, the effort of collaboration cannot be understated. It, it's, 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 it, it's, it's a lot of work, but, the, but the, you know, the, the benefits are you can actually get a substantial amount of money in and if you're clever, you, again, if you're modular about what you do, you can then reuse what you've built for other things. Whether it's commercial, non-commercial, in, 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 in Kendra's case, we're doing everything open source and um, want to submit, you know, create, uh, publish what, what the things that we've come up with. Questions?
I'm sorry if that was all a bit hurried, but basically in a half an hour, I think that's all we can tell you. But, you know, we can ask, answer as many questions as anyone's got. Yes. Um, so you said at the beginning of the, um, Peter, I think, that yeah. there was um, a, frame, a framework for the way that uh, participants should behave. How, how is that framework like? I mean, is it a series of agreements? With, you know, what is that? Okay. For any scheme with collaboration, be it from the Technology Strategy Board in the UK, through Eureka Eurostars in Europe, or through the Commission, participants will be accepted, will, will have to sign a grant offer agreement that says what you're going to do in return for the money. The grant offer agreement will say what partners can and can't do. And more importantly, uh, all partners will have to enter into a collaboration agreement that says the more detail about the way they're going to do it. What sort of things? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand. What I'm really getting to is that one of the problems with the App Store um, is that you have to, Sorry, you probably don't know about that, but... He just um, saw that. Yeah, so saw that, yeah. It is to do with the way that people uh, collaborate in an e ecosystem where there's money involved. Um, and that's one of the reasons that it failed. And I was just wondering whether the ideas that were in that could be transported into the App Store. Yes, I mean, the, the, collabor the model collaboration agreement from the European Commission is in the public domain. If you want to see that, either you can find it or I'll send you a copy and see, you know, what terms there are in it. I mean, it covers things like secrecy, it covers things like what happens if one of the partners wishes to leave, how he gives notice, how the other partners decide whether he can go or not, how the other partners decide whether he can, you know, be replaced, and how he's replaced, and all these things. Can I just, sorry, just, yeah. Um, obviously we started quite late today. Um, we're going to give it another 15 minutes till the next session starts. Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys want to have a tea or coffee break, uh, but if anyone wants to stay mm -hmm. for maybe Great. five, ten minutes yeah. for another yeah. set yeah. of questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it'll be 15 minutes till the next one. Yeah, sure. Great. So, right. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And if you've got offline questions, fine, but if you've got questions now, then, then yeah. carry on with code for another like yes. five minutes or something like that. Yes. Is there such a thing as minimum and maximum amount you can apply for? Yeah, that there's rules with all of the different schemes. In the Technology Strategy Board, the minimum award is about £15,000. But there again, when you consider the effort you would have to put in to get that, you could almost argue and say, well, hey, for that I could go out and do so many days contracting and raise that amount of money anyway. Mm. Yeah. Yes? I haven't had personal experience, but from what I've judged from talking with different people, that getting funding at the, the local scale or big scale, it's, there's a lot of kind of back scratching and who knows who and that kind of thing. Is that true? Or? No, no. I I think it's a fairly free and open scheme. You know, any scheme that involves judging of things obviously is subject to abuse. But I really think, particularly the European Commission's scheme. Where, because it's not the commission that chooses who gets the money, it's a panel of independent experts under contract to the commission. And the same with the TSB. It's almost as if it's, there's an arm's length between the people who've got the money and the people who are making the decisions who gets it. And that's, that's in, in all schemes, and that's all you know, fairly good. I think generally, don't try and do it yourself. It's a, it's a bureau, bureaucratic nightmare in terms of filling out forms and so forth. There are people that do this in universities you know, uh, continuously, full, full, time, full yeah. time. You know, um, just over the new year, I, I, in, I was in partnership with, with other, um, four, four other consortiums. So we put in four projects. Two of them have, uh, actually one didn't get, one stopped, we stopped the submission a day before because it just wasn't up to scratch. Another one failed, another one got it, uh, and another one we're waiting. And these are all with people that, you know, you know working consortiums where the people uh, you're the technology provider, probably most likely. Work with people that know about how to, you know how to manage these projects, how to fill in the forms, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, find those people. Start talking to those people. We we re I mean Daniel actually managed to buck the trend because we recommend to people start in the UK where at least it's all in a, a first language and the people are easy to get hold of to talk to. If you like the funding in the UK and that works for you then consider Europe, because Europe is so much bigger, harder, uh, more complicated, more bureaucratic. Yeah. 
But hey, Daniel just jumps in the deep end in Europe. <laughs> and he survives. Just about. Just about. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Obviously, there's variables involved in terms of the scheme, not the scheme, but the, um, the project, the idea that you've got. Um, yeah. And obviously, there's an amount of legwork that involves in terms of collaborating with people. But if I put myself in a dark room for a week, how far would I get in terms of the 